This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Let's do number uh, 11. A statement again. Which of the following is least likely to fall within financial management? Uh, the reason he says least likely is there's no sort of a rule book that this does, this doesn't sort of thing. But looking through it, uh, dividend payments to shareholders are increased. Well, dividend policy is normally, you would, it, oh, it's an important part of financial management, certainly. B, funds raised to finance a project. Yes, again, it's a fundamental part of financial management. C, surplus assets being sold off. Not something uh, we tend to look at as often within the exam, but even so. Um, effectively a way of raising the finance. D. Non-executive directors are appointed to the, uh, to the remuneration committee. Uh, no. I mean, I said there's not a rule book that the, the financial manager can't be involved in that. But uh, uh, it's not very likely, you know, and that's more of a sort of legal requirement. So the answer is D. 12. Oh, another one. Which of the following statements concerning profit are correct? Accounting profit is not the same as economic profit. Uh, correct. Accounting profit uses accounting conventions. The main thing about that is depreciation. Depreciation is based on original cost and you straight line a reducing balance. Whereas economic profit Although you can't be asked to um, calculate it in F9, um, you're looking not at what did assets originally cost, you're looking at what they're worth to us, what they can earn. And that's economic profit is different. Number two, profit takes account of risk. No, it doesn't take account of it. Certainly, if something's more risky, conventionally, we want a bigger return. Perhaps we want more profit but profit doesn't actually take account of it. Three, accounting profit can be manipulated by managers. Yes, something should come across quite a lot at F5 again. Uh, but um, managers can manipulate by ooh, transferring expenses from one period into another period, you know, depending on how they have accruals and prepayments, by... Um, manipulating the way they value inventory and so on. So the answer is A. Uh, 13, a numbers one, hopefully an easy enough one. What is the, the net investment in working capital required for the next year? So the net investment, working capital, um, we need to invest money in receivables, uh, we need to invest money in inventory. So it will show the total we're investing, the net investment, we subtract our payables. Um, so let's have a go. Uh, receivables, well, we know how much we're selling, 27 million. Receivables days are 50 days. So you should find this very standard. With 360 days in a year, average receivables, 50 days worth of sales, which is 3.75 million. Inventory. We've got inventory days of 60 days, so we're carrying 60 days worth, 63 60ths, of our cost of sales. Well, the cost of sales, 15 million inventories valued at cost. That comes to 2.5 million. So the total investment so far, 6.25 million. For the net investment, subtract payables, uh, 45 days, 
variables periods of 45 through 60 years, should really be uh, that fraction of our purchases. But as is very common, um, again, you have seen in the notes when I work through examples, if we're not told what our purchases are, we've no choice but to use cost of sales. So 45 three sixtieths of 15 million, 1.875, which gives us a net investment of 4.375 million. Yes, the answer is B. Uh, 14, back to statements again. And here, in fact, I mean, it's just definitions. I'm afraid um, if you need, go back to the notes, the lectures. But in terms of capital efficiency, capital market efficiency, to which of the following does the investor's belief relate? Uh, it says an investor believes they can make abnormal returns by studying past share price movements. Well, as I say, uh, I'm not to give a lecture, I mean, this really is definitions. That's the definition of C, technical analysis. Technical analysis is when you study how share prices have moved in the past and use that to predict how you think they'll move in the future. So, you know, share price, in the past, share prices may have gone up steadily for six months and then suddenly dropped and then gone up again, whatever. If you do see a nice pattern in the past, there are these people who watch that pattern and assume the same sort of pattern will continue in the future, predict when share price will suddenly go up or down and make profits as a result. That's technical analysis. 15, uh, yet another one. There's very little actual arithmetic in um, section A of this exam. Which of the following statements is our correct? Number one, an increase in the cost of equity leads to a fall in share price. Yes, if you look at the first formula on the formula sheet, the market value P0, dividend times one plus G over I minus G. Well, if the cost of equity goes up, you end up with a bigger number on the bottom. And if you're dividing by a bigger number, the market value will go down. So number one, sorry, that, look, that looks very pretty, but number one is correct. Number two, investors faced with increased risk will expect increased return as compensation Yes. I mean, any reading you've done about uh, 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 any of the lectures you've watched about capital asset pricing model, standardly, people will accept more risk in an investment, provided they get a higher return to compensate them. The two go together. Uh, finally, three, the cost of debt is usually lower than the cost of preference shares. Yes. It's back again to risk uh, that uh, debt borrowing uh, for the investor uh, carries fairly low risk because they're getting fixed interest each year. And so, all right, there is always the risk of the company going bankrupt, but provided the company doesn't go bankrupt, uh, the, we'd say there was no risk at all in the investment. Preference shares, well, although they're getting a fixed dividend each year, there is that much more risk that some years they may not get the dividend. They can only be paid a dividend if the company has actually got sufficient profits. And so they lose out before debt do. I mean, debt. They pay the interest out first. Only any profit left over is available for shareholders. So it's taken me a long time to say it, but because uh, preference shares are a bit more risky than debt, you'd expect the cost of preference shares to be higher or the cost of debt to be lower. So all three are correct. The answer's D. Right, uh, which was 16. 16. 
Uh, which of the following government actions relate predominantly to fiscal policy? Fiscal policy uh, to do with collecting the tax and spending it. Uh, number one, decreasing interest rates in order to stimulate consumer spending. Governments may do that, but that's not actually fiscal policy. Two, reducing tax while maintaining public spending. Yes, it is, as I said, this collect the tax in and how they're spending it. Uh, so two uh, does relate predominantly to fiscal policy. Uh, three, using official foreign currency reserves to buy the domestic currency. Again, there may be good reasons for doing that, but it's nothing to do with um, the tax and spending. Uh, four, borrowing money from capital markets and spending on public works. Yes, uh, yet again, it fits in with what I was saying. So it's two and four. The answer is C. Uh, 17. The following are extracts from a statement of financial position of a company. It says, what is the market value based gearing of a company defined as part prior charge capital to equity? Uh, two things before we do it. First of all, gearing. Uh, it does say what's it based on market values. That's the most meaningful way of gearing. And here, when I look at the question, we are given market values. Uh, other times you could be asked to calculate it based on book values, in which case we'd use the values in the balance sheet, nominal values. Uh, secondly, as you should be aware, uh, gearing can be measured in two ways. It's either debt to equity or debt to debt plus equity. Uh, but the examiner will always tell you, and he has here, it's defined as being prior charged capital divided by the equity. So it's very much a question of working out the figures. Um, first of all, what's equity? Uh, the shares have a nominal value of 50 cents and are trading at $5. Well, from the balance sheet, the nominal value is 8 million. I'll work in thousands, obviously. However, if they're 50 cent shares, it must mean the 16,000, 16 million, but 16,000 shares. And if the market value is $5, then the market value of the equity is 80,000. Uh, now, a lot of people want to add on reserves. They've got plus 20,000. No. If we're basing on book values, yes. But surely one of the most obvious reasons why the market value of the shares is bigger than the 8,000 book value is because the company's been making profit and has reserves. The market value takes account of uh, whatever retained earnings, whatever reserves there are. Uh, what else? Um, well, our non-current liabilities our prior charge capital. Bonds with 4,000. The nominal value is 100, the trading at 105. And so the market value, 105 for every 100, which is, I think it's 4,200, isn't it? Let me check. 4,200. We've also got the bank loan. Uh, bank loans don't have market values. I mean, if you borrowed 6,200, you borrowed 6,200. And finally, preference shares. Remember, they effectively told you anyway here. Uh, preference shares are treated as non-current liabilities. They are prior charge capital. So there are 2,000 nominal value. They are dollar shares. So it's 2,000 shares. Uh, they're trading at 80 cents. The market value is 80 cents. And so they come to 1,600. The total prior charge capital, uh, 12,000. I said at the beginning, obviously these are all thousands, but for a ratio it doesn't matter. You know, it's 80 million, it's 12 million. Uh, finally, therefore, what's the, um, the gearing? 
is divided as prior charge capital 12,000 divided by the equity of 80. Which in percentage terms is 15%. The answer's A. That should have been a pretty quick one. It looks as though it's an enormous question, obviously. It's the longest in terms of the typing. Uh, but there's not really too much excuse there. Nearly there. Number 18. Oh, off we go again with a statement. Which of the following statements is correct? Governments may choose to raise interest rates so that the general expenditure in the economy will increase. I don't see why that should be the case. No. The normal yield curve slopes upwards to reflect increasing compensation to investors for being unable to use their cash now. Yes, very standard. Again, look at the notes. It's in there that um, the yield curve is showing the interest rates for different periods of borrowing. You know, what's the interest rate if you're borrowing or depositing for one year? What is it if you're doing it for two years, three years, four years? Uh, and the normal yield curve, we generally say it slopes upwards, that the longer money is tied up for, the higher the annual equivalent annual interest rate will be. So B is true. C, the yield on long-term notes is lower than the yield on short-term notes because long-term debt is less risky for a company than short-term debt. No. Uh, long-term debt, it may be less risky. That's arguable. Uh, but, I mean, it's back to the yield curve. It's normally the other way around. Uh, D, expectations theory states that future interest... Now, here the examiner is a bit unfair because expectations theory, there are several expectations theories. However, in most textbooks, it doesn't relate to future interest rates. Um, it relates uh, more to exchange rates. So he's a bit unfair there, to be perfectly honest, but the answer is B. 19. Oh, a very conventional one. What's the market price of the company's shares to the nearest cent on the next dividend basis? They've just paid a dividend. They expected to pay this much in a year's time. The cost of equity is 13%. Well, it's the dividend valuation formula. P naught is D naught times 1 plus G over RE minus G. Uh, P naught is the, market, the exited market value, which is what we're after. Uh, RE is the cost of equity of the shareholders required rate of return, which is 13% or 0 0.13. G is the dividend growth rate. Well, on the information we've got, we expect it to be 33.6 in one year. It's 32 now. And so 1 plus the growth rate is 1.05, G, the growth rate, is 0 0.05 or 5%. And of course, D naught is the dividend they've just paid, the current dividend of 32. So sticking it in the formula, P naught, again, D naught, 1 plus G, R E minus G, is 32 times 1 plus g 1.05 over re 0.13 minus g 0.05 uh, which comes to 32 times 1.05 divided by because I took my head 0 0.08 I get 420 and I have been working I always work in cents but the market value is 420 cents or of course four dollar twenty 
uh, the answer is D. And remember, I did say it, but P naught is the X div price. Irrelevant here, but if they had have asked you for a cum div price, that would be the price assuming they were about to pay the current dividend. It would be 32 cents higher, uh, but here irrelevant. Last of all for section A, number 20. Now, I, actually, I, I thought a rather unusual one for F9. It's not something I think most people, or me included, would have actually learned. If you need to make a guess, although I think it, uh, general knowledge, provided you have with the words, um, should answer it. Which of the following is usually seen as forms of market failure where regulation may be a solution? And the first rather gives it away what, is, what he means, imperfect competition. The sort of things where uh, a situation where one company may have a monopoly. It's very standard in most places in the world to have regulation to try and stop companies having uh, too big a monopoly. So this is um, seen as a form of market failure where regulation may be a solution. The answer is yes. And so if you see what he's getting at, I think the other two tend to follow on. Number two, social costs or externalities. Uh, yes, there's regulation, you expect to be regulation over things that affect um, society. And three, Imperfect information. You should know, uh, know the term as we apply it to the stock exchange. Uh, that imperfect information. The more information is available to shareholders, the better the information, the better things are. And there are, in most countries, regulations about the sort of information companies uh, have to give. So all three of those are areas where regulation may help solve problems that, that, that exist. The answer is D. There we are, that's section A.